I'm John Sargent, and welcome to Argumental, the show where the brightest brains in comedy debate the biggest issues facing mankind. Is there time to save the planet? Should creationism be taught in schools? And what the hell is Yakult? <laughs> Here to argue such burning issues and others like them are for the red team, Captain Marcus Brigstock, and his special guest, Frankie Boyle. <laughs> And opposing them, captain of the blue team, Rufus Hound, and his special guest, Phil Jupiter. <laughs> OK, we begin with round one, where I ask the teams to tackle a topic that's been around even longer than I have. It's this one. <laughs> the royal family, Britain's leading stars of stamps and coinage. These balcony-hogging, grouse-shooting, corgi-botherers have occupied a special place in the hearts and on the tea towels of our nation. <laughs> but the statement I'd like our teams to argue about is, the royal family serves no purpose. <laughs> Up first, supporting the statement, it's Marcus Brigstock. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, the royal family serve no purpose. They will serve porpoise, dolphin, panda and swan, <laughs> but no purpose. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the whole point of this, really, is that there is nothing that the royal family do, there is no function that they serve that could not be done by somebody or something else. Who here, honestly, wouldn't be happy to see a hospital wing opened by a Dalek? Be honest. <laughs> I declare this wing open! <laughs> How lovely would it be to see one of the cheeky girls appear on a stamp? Why should it only be Lembit Opic who gets to lick Gabriella? <laughs> on Christmas Day in the afternoon, why couldn't the formerly known as Queen's Speech be delivered by Mr Bruce Forsyth? <laughs> Truly a treasure to the nation. 850 years old. <laughs> Fantastic. You're welcome. What a wonderful year it's been. Bring the auto cue closer, I've no idea. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's important to establish that of the many things that the royal family do, none of them, none of them serves any relevant purpose. I mean, waving is not a purpose. <laughs> sure, the royal family have adapted their own styles. The Queen waves like this, Prince Charles like this, Philip like this. <laughs> and Harry like this. <laughs> Now, ladies and gentlemen, one of the things the royal family do is they turn up in places that are stricken. Uh, they, it's sort of gloating by appointment, is roughly, <laughs> roughly how that works. When Tewkesbury fills up with water again, uh, Prince Charles likes to turn up in a boat and say things like, it's awful, uh, you know, uh, uh, anyway, uh, main thing is, uh, what's the fishing like in your sitting room? <laughs> he serves no purpose. He could do something useful, but he's unable to. The useful thing would be to turn up, get out of the boat, go, hey, everybody, all back to mine. You can have a free go on my wife. And the people of Tewkesbury would reply, I'd sooner drown. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the royal family serve no purpose. And for that reason, vote with the red team. I thank you. Thanks, Marcus. Next up, arguing that the royals do serve a purpose, Phil Jupiter. Constructed anti royal argument or audition for dead ringers, ladies and gentlemen. You be the judges. <laughs> I'll accept both. <laughs> and by the way, it's <laughs> I declare this hospital open. Al <laughs> <laughs> Dahl in my face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I'll accept that. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, the reason Mr. Brigstock carries such ire towards the Windsors is that uh, there's been a 500-year argument between his family and theirs. I want you to look upon his disapproval of the royals as a dispute with former neighbours. <laughs> when you've lost Cornwall to someone in a game of cribbage, there's bitterness. <laughs> Marcus mentioned swans. What would this country be like if it wasn't for the fact that the swan's natural predator, the Queen, Lived 
<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we will be walking around all our arms broken. <laughs> Smashed by their powerful wings. <laughs> Another way the swan can kill is by stiffening its neck and flying at you at a high speed. <laughs> Going through your body like a feathery javelin. <laughs> Without the queen, swans would run right. And another reason, ladies and gentlemen, that I feel the royal family serves a vital purpose to this great nation of ours is that we are now, always have been, and always will be, a bunting-based economy. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, please vote with Team Blue. Thanks, Phil, Rufus, and thank you. You can join in now. The thing is, the royal family does serve a purpose. It does not, Hal. It does. It, it does it's not. It's an archaic purpose, but it does serve a purpose. Basically, through the House of Commons and the House of Lords, no law can be passed if she then chooses the royal veto. And no, she's your not system, allowed to exercise it. But that is still her purpose, is that if we all decide to go mad, she is still the one who can say, all right, we've all had a lovely drink here. Calm down. Is that, is that what you think you're going to do? Look, we've all had a drink. Yeah. Right? <laughs> we've all had a drink. Yeah. We know we have. All right, look. <laughs> Crown's off, yeah? Crown's off now. <laughs> you made me mad. I'm one of you. I'm one of you, yeah. <laughs> if somebody put a couple of Nurofen in Phil's lager, I want to keep him off me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but they serve, they serve <laughs> no purpose. After all this time, the colour could just troop itself. <laughs> You're talking nonsense. No surprise that this anti-royal feeling comes no, 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 from no, no, a man. No, no, not anti-royal. I'm not anti-royal. Okay. You I'm just argued the royal family serves no purpose. Yes, that, they... that could come across a smidge anti-royal. <laughs> I'm not anti-royal. I come from very similar stock. I serve no purpose. <laughs> I think it's a wonderful thing. I'm not saying we get rid of them. I'm just saying they serve. No purpose. <laughs> Maybe we should find them a purpose. We, we could, like, give them out to people, like, you know, you do it the way you do it, sort of uh, rescue animals. Mm. <laughs> Some old lady could have the Queen. Oh, I look in the Queen's eyes occasionally. It's almost as if she's human. <laughs> uh, Sergeant at Arms, have you interviewed uh, any or many of the royal family? Have you met them in your. No, no, your I've, I've met a few of them. They have crowd around a bit, but, you know, you push them away. <laughs> OK, I think we've got to the end of this particular round. Thank you. So, who made the best argument? Time for our audience to decide. It's a red card for Marcus and Frankie and a blue one for Rufus and Phil. Vote now. Excellent. Up the Republic! So, it's a win for the red team. Well done, Marcus and Frankie. The young royals are far more accessible these days. I myself have met Prince William and Harry many times, usually when I'm in bougies drinking mojitos with Frank <laughs> Lampard and my favourite sugar babe. <laughs> Time now for the celebrity round where the subject on trial is this woman. Heather Mills, the beetle-bagging, landmine-lambasting, Geordie Jazzmag starlet. <laughs> she's got £25 million in the bank and she's currently single. So, the statement I want the teams to argue about tonight is this. Heather Mills would make a great catch. <laughs> Up first, and in favour of this idea, it's Frankie Boyle. <laughs> Heather Ann Mills, born in 1960, partially died in 1993. <laughs> I simply adore what remains of her. <laughs> I've never been that bothered about women's left feet. If anything, they're an annoying extra. <laughs> Give me a woman with a hysterical personality disorder <laughs> and her left leg chopped off below the knee, and I'm happy. <laughs> She's made people think about landmines. She's made people think the world would be a better place if she stood on one. <laughs> Let's not forget, Heather Mills is loaded! £23 million. Do you think if I had £23 million, I'd be standing here? I would, but I wouldn't give a fuck. <laughs> She's a great catch.
Thank you, thank you. Next up, arguing that Heather Mills would not make a great catch, it's Rufus Hound. Now, there's a word I'm not allowed to use on television. Yes, that word. <laughs> you know it. I know it. She is it. <laughs> This is a woman who, if she approached you in a bar and asked for your number, you know she means sort code. <laughs> so, the question we're here to answer is, is she a catch? Well, let's look on the upside. Yes, she's worth 25 million quid and give her a due, she's not bad looking. But, friends, do me this small honour. I'd like you to all close your eyes. Just close your eyes now, everybody. Close your eyes. Now imagine you've gathered all your friends and family together. Now imagine you're telling them you're dating Heather Mills. <laughs> now listen. Really listen. Can you hear that? It's the word that can't be said on television. <laughs> Which only goes to prove that Heather Mills would not make a great catch. Vote Blue, I think. Thank you, Rufus. OK, let's see which team our studio audience thinks made the best case. It's a red card for Marcus and Frankie and a blue one for Rufus and Phil. That is the biggest landslide we've ever seen. On this <laughs> Heather, I hope you're watching. So, a massive victory for the blue team. Well done, Rufus and Phil. Heather Mills has been quiet since the divorce, winning eight Olympic gold medals, the Pulitzer Prize, <laughs> and most incredibly guiding Stoke City into the Premiership. <laughs> Heather Mills famously burst into tears on the GMTV sofa. It was their worst case of crying since the forklift truck crashed carrying Eamon Holmes' breakfast. <laughs> OK, time for a quick break now, but join us in a minute when we'll be asking whether piercings are classier than tattoos. Don't go away. <laughs> Welcome back to Argumental, the show with more highly charged disagreements than a Rooney family get-together. <laughs> Right, next up is the slideshow. One member of each team will again be debating a controversial issue, but this time I want them to illustrate their argument with a series of random pictures which they've never seen before. Rufus, I'd like you to start in support of the statement that piercings are classier than tattoos. Here's a picture to start you off. <laughs> and there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. Piercings are clearly classier than tattoos. <laughs> tattoos are... Just. <laughs> no way of turning your tongue and mouth into a makeshift vagina. <laughs> or, you know, at least with this piercing, you don't have to wonder whether he's in. You just knock and... <laughs> wait for him to answer. Tattoos are in no way classy. Check this. <laughs> now then. <laughs> this puppy, yes, it's a puppy, could be used <laughs> as the template for a tattoo. Imagine that, gents. You peel off the clothes of a lady new to your life and there she has a little puppy tattooed. Now, imagine this. Instead of that, she's got an actual puppy stapled to her. <laughs> now, you're thinking, well, the tattoo would be better, but you'd be wrong. <laughs> Why? Because if you gently undo the staple, then you have the quiet time with the lady of your choice, and then you get to play with a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> which you could one day train to kill. <laughs> well done, Rufus. Next up, arguing that piercings are not classier than tattoos, it's Frankie Boyle. 
Here's your first picture. Yes, my father. Uh, <laughs> piercings are not classier than tattoos. But piercings are incredibly painful. Do you know how painful it is to get a Prince Albert done? Very painful indeed, judging by the screams of the young boy I had strapped to my Black & Decker workmates. <laughs> That man has had his whole life story tattooed on his body. He was held in a prison for 70 years and shagged by a monster. <laughs> they say that tongue piercings make oral sex better. I find that the step-by-step -step instructions that I've had tattooed onto my penis <laughs> are actually much more efficient. <laughs> button piercing, right? It isn't sexy. Men think it's sexy because it reminds them of the staple in a porno mag. <laughs> How many... Well... <laughs> with, with oral piercings, isn't the idea that you make blowjobs better? Not obviously as good as someone with no teeth. That's the... <laughs> that's the gold standard, isn't it? <laughs> If you go to a dinner party, do you think the other guests will think that you're more classy if you tell them that you've got a little rose tattooed discreetly on your hip? Or if you tell them that you had a lunatic take you into a back room and fire a hole through your tongue to make you better at sucking dicks? <laughs> Well done, thank you. Marcus and Phil, anything you want to add before the vote? Uh, I think uh, it's basically the case that piercings are classier than tattoos. It's the working classes that have tattoos. You only see the working classes with love and hate across their knuckles. You don't see that with the middle classes, do you? They have love and pate. <laughs> I, it's a true story. I used to work on an oil rig in the... Believe it or not... This isn't a true story. <laughs> It is. Honestly, what were you, the <laughs> red boy? Yeah. <laughs> True story, I was boxing George Foreman one time. <laughs> captain, Captain, there's a gusher. What should we do? <laughs> in the in the Cromarty Firth, and there was a crane operator. <laughs> That's it. Geology will make it believable. Yes. <laughs> and in the, Scotland, the Dan not. Countess was a rig. Uh, rented by Midland Scottish Resources, owned by a man who was a friend of my father's. Oh. <laughs> Douglas, make a man of him. <laughs> Put him on the rigs and bring me back when he's been broken. That's <laughs> it. That was pretty much a thrust of it. Anyway, look, you've spoiled it now. Yeah. There was a bloke called Keith and he had love and hate tattooed on his hands, but he'd lost one finger in a crane accident, so he <laughs> said love and hat. <laughs> it was just a lovely thing. <laughs> love. Hat, How so. did you end up in an oil rig? Had you got so used to the atmosphere of tense homosexuality at boarding school <laughs> that you had to sort of gradually re-enter the real world through... It wasn't the real world he was re-entering. <laughs> <laughs> he had to actually fight his way off that rig. I heard he bit a bloke's finger off. <laughs> <laughs> I heard he didn't bite it. <laughs> <laughs> it snapped off. <laughs> it's bloody cold on those rigs. <laughs> Are you suggesting I had a finger protruding from my anus with the letter E written on it? <laughs> that is really hard Scottish Scrabble. <laughs> OK, thanks very much. Thank you, teams. OK, let's find out who made the best case. It's red for Frankie and blue for Rufus. Vote now. There's a lot of tattooed freaks over there, but the rest of it looks all right. So, that's a very close vote, but it looks like a victory for the red team. Well done, Frankie Boyle. Our next round is called Flip Flop, where we find out how well our teams can argue with themselves. I'll give a player a statement which they must argue for until they hear this sound. At which point they must perform a U-turn and argue against it. Then flip flop their argument every time I press the buzzer. Marcus and Phil, you're up for this one. It's Marcus first. I'd like you to begin by arguing that salad is better than chips. 
Of course salad's better than chips. Everybody knows salad's better than chips. Why? What can you put on chips? Well, vinegar, ketchup, mayonnaise, mustard at a push. On salad, you've got an enormous range of dressings. You've got vinaigrette, uh, you've got mayonnaise, ketchup, mustard, <laughs> vinegar. You've got Newman's own... Newman's own, which is horrible, and that's why salad is disgusting. <laughs> no one wants Newman's own on their salad. That's a revolting thing. <laughs> chips are way better than salad. Of course they are, ladies and gentlemen, because chips are nicer. If you're deaf in the mouth... <laughs> salad is where it's at. <laughs> salad is... <laughs> salad... <laughs> It's, um, <laughs> salad is a classy thing. If you're going out and trying to impress a lady on a date, do you want to say, hey, let's go and have uh, uh, some chips? Yes, you do. <laughs> that's what you want to do, because that's what ladies like. They want to think of a TV show set on the highways of America on motorbikes. You didn't see that show called Salad, did you? <laughs> It's a shame, though, because <laughs> had it been called salad, that would have been awesome. <laughs> uh, salad is rubbish because, because uh, it's, you know, it's so boring, it can't be fried. Leave it, Frankie, I know you have your own rules in Scotland. <laughs> you know, you can't start a salad fight in a, in a chip shop and fish and chips. Fish and chips, ladies and gentlemen, fish and chips. Who wants fish and salad? Me. <laughs> I give you the niçoise. <laughs> Fish. Thanks, Marcus. Personally, I love a good salad, especially when it comes with its traditional garnish of sesame seed bun, cheeseburger and chips. <laughs> Phil, you're up next. I'd like you to argue that there's nothing wrong with pornography. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with pornography. What else would occupy the annoying teenage boys of this country by keeping them sequestered away in their own bedrooms, bashing away like unemployed Polish builders at their very own little tools there, like spider monkeys, hungry for their own erotic action. It's just the kind of thing that you really need to keep these oiks off the street. And yet, I feel <laughs> that it would be nice if these chaps could get out a little more often and let go of the evils of this pernicious trade. Oh, yes. Now, where would the internet be without pornography? Nowhere. No one would use it if it wasn't for porn. <laughs> People would just be staring at their laptops, maybe putting bread in them, trying to make toasted sandwiches, <laughs> because Lord alone knows you can't masturbate over a sandwich. <laughs> and yet... <laughs> I feel, I fear I have said too much, Mr Darcy. <laughs> Pornography is... Am I for or against it at the against minute? It. <laughs> against it, yes. <laughs> this is a nightmare. Yes. This is like... <laughs> I feel like I'm in the old SDP. It's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> it's, it's good. It's good now. Yeah. I love wanking. Um, <laughs> yes. Wow! Uh, boy! Nothing like pleasuring yourself in front of a Freeman's catalogue, which isn't strictly porn, because it's got mowers in there as well. And yeah, they're quite useful. Well, I get a bit of a twitch over a mower, to be honest with you. There's nothing like being out in the garden having a look at a really good... I mean, one of those green ones with a bin on the front and a roller at the back so you get a really smooth finish. What are we talking about? I really... <laughs> and finally, I don't like wanking because... Uh, it's a terrible, terrible habit, and it uh, causes bad eyesight. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you, Phil. Excellent flip-flopping. <laughs> Time to ask the audience who flip-flopped the best. Red cards for Marcus or blue cards for Phil? Vote now. We've taken one. OK, so it's a victory for the blue team. Well done, Phil. Time now for the quick-fire round and a last chance for our teams to demonstrate their argumental prowess. I'm going to show them a series of images. All they have to do is suggest an argument to go with them, and this is the deciding round. OK, guys, here's your first one. This is an argument against polonium gnomes. 
Is this an argument against buying a house off Joseph Fritzel? <laughs> this is an argument against weeding with Sillit Bang. <laughs> Bang! And the garden's gone. <laughs> OK, let's try another one. <laughs> Is it an argument for better-looking gnomes? <laughs> it's, uh, it's an argument against saying to your cabinet, right, I'm going to stand by that hedge. Who's with me? <laughs> it's an argument that even his maze is dull. Is it an argument for cutting all hedges to shoulder height, no matter what's in the way? <laughs> <laughs> Next picture. <laughs> That's an argument against becoming a ball boy in that village. <laughs> Is it an argument that Hogwarts should just stick to Quidditch? <laughs> Is it an argument against putting helium into Robinson's barley water? <laughs> This is an argument for not annoying Darren Brown. <laughs> Next picture. Okay. <laughs> oh, this is this is an argument against trying to hide fruit polos in your cleavage. <laughs> I think this is an argument against letting the agency throw in a two for one hooker deal. <laughs> is it an argument against giving sex dolls to lesbian pensioners? <laughs> This is an argument for living long enough to see the mighty Boosh in 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that's it. So, for the final time, it's down to our studio audience to decide who made the best case. Red for Marcus and Frankie, and blue for Rufus and Phil. Vote now. Please, please. It looks a bit red up there to me. <laughs> what have you people done? I can tell you it's a very close vote, but the red team have oh. won. Yes! Which means... Yes! Surprising! Uh, In your face, Phil! In your face! In your face! In your face! Which means that this week's winners are the red team. Well done, Marcus Brigstock and Frankie Boyle. Commiserations to Rufus Hound and Phil Jupitus. That's all we've got time for. Good night. <laughs>